Romans. We're going to be in chapter 3. So if you've got a Bible and you want to turn there, or if you have an app on your phone, I use the Christian Standard Bible if you want to synchronize with me. And we're going to look at the first 11 verses from chapter 3 of the book of Philippians. But before we do that, let me give you something. The value of knowing Christ can't be overestimated, and our tendency to embrace false gospels shouldn't be underestimated. That will make more sense as we work our way through this passage. So let's read what God's Word has for us. Philippians 3, starting in verse 1. In addition, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. To write to you again about this is no trouble for me and is a safeguard for you. Watch out for the dogs. Watch out for the evil workers. Watch out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision, the ones who worship by the Spirit of God, boast in Christ Jesus, and do not put confidence in the flesh. Although I have reasons for confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks they have grounds for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews. Regarding the law, a Pharisee. Regarding zeal, persecuting the church. Regarding the righteousness that is in the law, blameless. But everything that was a gain to me, I have considered to be a loss because of Christ. More than that, I also consider everything to be a loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Because of him, I have suffered the loss of all things and consider them as dung so that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own from the law, but one that is through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. My goal is to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, assuming that I will somehow reach the resurrection from among the dead. This message is just simply called Knowing Christ. For the past few weeks, we've looked at the gospel life. Last week, my friend Chad Grigsby did a fantastic job of bringing a message to you about the need for sharing that gospel life. Um, He talked to you some principles of multiplication. I hope some of that was very eye-opening for you. It's just simply the truth that if any one of us, just one of us, were to get committed to making one disciple each year, we could reach everyone on this planet in 34 years. Just one of us, all by themselves. Just through the power of multiplication, reaching one disciple who learns to make disciples, and then the next year, the two of you, and so on and so forth. That's eye-opening. I'm not even 40 years old yet. I could probably live long enough to pull that off if I set my mind to it. And what would it look like if more than one of us did? We shared this gospel life and this power of multiplication as we make disciples. This is all about advancing the gospel. And this was the very heart of Paul. Don't don't forget, go all the way back to the beginning of the book of Philippians. As he shared about his troubles, as he talked about his imprisonment, he always said, all of these things that I've gone through, they've actually served to advance the gospel. That's what he was all about. And so he always was looking and seeing how the gospel was being pushed forward, even through some of his trouble and some of his difficulty, because he was all about that. In this next section, Paul stresses the dangers of false gospels and his effort to warn the Philippians is best done through training them and reminding them of the true gospel. The best way to identify the phony is to know what the real deal is. So he shares not only how to know Christ, but also the marks of a legitimate believer. So what I want to do this morning is work our way back through these 11 verses. And I want to share um, what the marks are of someone who knows Christ. And then how to know Christ. If you're in the room and you hear this message or if you hear it later via video or audio, my goal is that by the end of this message you will have heard the true gospel and you will have an opportunity to respond to it. But also part of my goal is that those of us who have believed the true gospel will be reminded of it and our daily need for it. But first, a warning. That's, if you're taking notes, that's the first section. Let's look at verse 1 and 2 again. He says, but first, a warning. He says, in addition, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. In some translations, it actually says, finally. And then he goes on to talk, finally. And, and so that's one of those moments where you know whenever he says, finally, he's not even close to done. Um, he's got a whole other chapter after this one. Rejoice in the Lord. And he says this, to write to you again about this, what I'm about to talk about, it's no trouble for me, and it's a safeguard for you. He stresses that it's no problem for him. It's for their safety. It's a warning. And then here's the warning. 
Watch out for the dogs. Watch out for the evil workers. Watch out for those who mutilate the flesh. These are not three separate groups. He's not saying watch out for dogs, watch out for evil workers, and watch out for people who mutilate the flesh. It's all the same people. It's the same person. And now when I hear watch out for dogs, um, this means something different to us than it did to them. Okay? Uh, when, for, mo- for most of us, I would say those of us in here who have good hearts, when we think of dogs, I'm not talking about cat people. Y'all don't have to listen for a minute. <laughs> but for the people who have love in their heart and who love the furry, fluffy little dogs. I've loved them my whole life. When I was a boy, I wanted one so bad. I would go and get the encyclopedia, the D encyclopedia. Y'all remember those? The actual book. And I, I would study all of the different breeds of dog and I, I could identify them. And actually, when I was really young, I wanted to be a veterinarian. That's what I wanted to do. But I wanted to have a practice that only, um, that only dealt with dogs because I didn't want anything to do with cats or anything else. And so I love dogs. And I remember begging my dad for a dog. I would use all the classic techniques to try to manipulate him. You know, everything from, hey, dad, I'll take care of him. It'll help me learn, you know, all, this, all these things. It'll help me to learn responsibility. And that didn't work. So I tried, um, you know, dad, dog is just God spelled backwards. That one... My dad's a retired pastor. That one didn't work. But he finally gave in. I remember the first dog I had. He, he grew to, he was adorable as a puppy. He grew to be one of the ugliest dogs I've ever seen. He was half blue healer and half collie. So if you can for a moment, if you know at all what a blue healer looks like, that's what his body was. But then his neck and head was lassie. Um, and when I got him, he had one big spot on his back. So I named him Spot. I was very creative, even from a young age. And as he got bigger, because he was part blue healer, he was covered in spots, so the name still worked. I named him Spot. Um, he was an ugly dog. I, you know, I, I took care of him. I loved, I loved the dog. But for them, when they heard dog, they didn't think about the domesticated dogs that we had. They thought of wild packs of dogs that when they came into your neighborhood, they would tear things up and destroy. And if you tried to get near one, they showed their teeth immediately. Uh, maybe they were diseased. They were not something that was treasured and not something you brought into your home as a pet. And actually, Jews would refer to Gentiles as Gentile dogs. This was um, very disrespectful. Um, It was slander. He says, watch out for the dogs. Watch out for the evildoers. Watch out for those who mutilate the flesh. The people he's talking about are, are what's called Judaizers. And all that meant was these are people who were Orthodox Jews who had heard the gospel. And they would teach the gospel, but then they would add to it that before you could have faith in Jesus Christ, you had to become a Jew, which meant you had to be circumcised if you were a male. If you don't know what circumcision is, do not Google it. Um, you will not enjoy what you find there. Ask a close friend. They had to be circumcised. It was a physical ritual to their body. And then they had to begin to obey all of the religious laws and customs of the Jewish people before they could become a legitimate Christian. Okay? So he says, watch out for the dogs. He actually refers to these Orthodox Jews the same way they would refer to Gentiles because they're saying, hey, all you Gentiles, you're non-Jews. You have to follow all these rules and do all of these things before you can have faith in Christ. And he warns them. He's warning them about false gospels. There's really two primary ways to have a false gospel. We know what the gospel is, right? It's the good news of Jesus Christ, what he's done for us on the cross, that uh, righteousness, his righteousness can be imputed to us. We can be forgiven of our sins, reunited with God. We know that, okay? Most of us. There's two ways to produce a false gospel, really. One is you take something away from it. The other is you add something to it. So let's say we were going to take something away from the true gospel. We might uh, go after the divinity of Christ and say he wasn't really God. He, all those things, I believe everything else, but he wasn't the son of God. Well, what happens when you remove Jesus' divinity? Well, you, remove, you kill it. You, you, that's no gospel at all. Now he no longer came down from the Father, and actually everything that he said as he taught was all a lie. There's no gospel because you've removed something, key element from it. How about this? Um, he didn't really rise from the dead. His body was stolen by his. Well, if he, didn't, if he was never raised, then he never came out in victory over death, and it, it removed something. So that's one way to produce a false gospel. Believe most of it, but take out some element or maybe more than one. The other is to add something to it. And most of us immediately recognize the ones that they take something away. But the, the ones where they add something to, they're, they're more insidious. And I would say that there are some of us in this room that believe some sort of a false gospel. And that's where you add anything to 
Justification through Christ alone, by faith alone. You add to it. Now, if you're a believer for a long time, you would think, why would anyone believe a gospel that adds something to? Here's what these dogs, these evildoers, these mutilators of the flesh added to. They said, well, before you can believe in Jesus Christ and become a Christian, you have to first become a Jew. So if you're a Gentile, that means you're going to have to be circumcised. That's where he talks about mutilating the flesh. Okay, he's going very, he's using hyperbole here. He's saying these ones, they're going to mutilate the flesh and they're going to make you obey all of these laws and customs and become a, a Jew before you can come to Jesus. They added something too. Well, why would I want to do that? Faith in Jesus alone sounds way easier. Why do I want to add stuff to it? He's warning us because what, what we're talking about here is legalism. It's adding following of rules and the works of man to faith in Jesus Christ. And saying that you have to have both before you know Jesus and are redeemed, before you're saved. It's called legalism. Well, that sounds terrible to me. Why would I want to do that? But the truth is, is that for most of us, it's actually a little bit attractive. And here's why. Because we believe in our sinful nature that we can do something good enough to earn a little bit of God's love and acceptance. Many of us actually believe that we have to do something to improve ourselves before Jesus will love us. For the most part, it's because in this world or other relationships, we can't act any way we want and still be loved and accepted, can we? We can't. It's Mother's Day. Mom's unconditional love, right? You think you can do something bad enough to break the unconditional love of your mother? Never. I bet you could. But the love of Christ isn't like human love. So we think somewhere in us that we can do something to add to it. This is your friends who, when you invite them to come to church with you, you say, you should come. We've got, we've got good music, and there's a great atmosphere, and the pastor opens God's word. It's just really simple teaching. I think you would get a lot out of it. You do that, and they say, I know I need to. I need to get right with God, but i got to clean up some stuff in my life first. They're adding to the gospel. Jesus isn't enough. You've got to add something to it. And so he warns them because false teachers had come into their church and started teaching something. And many of them, because they were so young and raw and new in the faith, they didn't know. They were like, well, what's going on? This is a little different than what Paul taught. And he warned them, hey, watch out for that. Watch out for these counterfeits, these phonies, these false because what they're doing, they're not well-meaning. He calls them evildoers. Do you not realize that the enemy, Satan, will preach a false gospel? He knows the truth of Jesus. He can preach it. He just adds something to it or he takes something away from it. So he says, watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those who mutilate the flesh. And then he says, I want you to understand again. This is why it's no trouble for me, guys, to teach this again. The marks of knowing Christ. And this is the second part, if you're taking notes. The marks of knowing Christ. So here's what he says in verse 3. Well, in verse 2, don't forget, he says, watch out for those people, watch out for those who mutilate the flesh. He's talking about circumcision. And then he says this in verse 3, for we are the circumcision. He doesn't say we've been circumcised. He doesn't say we, we're among the group of circumcised people. He says we are the circumcision. Well, what was the circumcision? Well, it was an outward symbolic act to symbolize your acceptance of the covenant relationship with God. And so he says rather than us having to do something physically to our bodies, now the way that we live is the circumcision. It shows the commitment of our hearts. So he says this, we are the circumcision. And here's the first mark of knowing Christ. The ones who worship by the Spirit of God. These are the ones who, they, they have the outward marks. Now don't mistake what this is. These are not action steps. Step one to knowing Christ. Make sure you worship by the Spirit of God. This is evidence that is seen from the way that you live your life. It's after the fact. Where he looks at you and go, oh, they worship by the Spirit of God. That's a mark of them knowing Christ. But it's more than just what we do in this service. When we think worship, most of us think music, right? Or we think the worship service. So there's music, and then there's preaching, and then we'll say we're going to worship through giving, all of that, okay? The idea of worship here isn't a service. 
It is service. It is the way that we live our lives. When he says those who worship by the Spirit of God, he's talking about people who live a life devoted to God. That's a mark of knowing Christ. Wouldn't we all agree with that? Like, if you know Jesus, you're going to live a life devoted to Jesus. That just seems obvious, but he wants to make sure they know this. We are the circumcision, and, and we show that through worshiping by the Spirit of God, a life devoted to God. But he keeps going. We are the circumcision, the ones who worship by the Spirit of God. And then he gives the next thing. We boast in Christ Jesus. That's the second point you have there. We glory or we boast or we brag on Jesus Christ. Not in our status, not in our achievements, not in our gifting. We can't even brag about being saved because it was done by the work of somebody else. So we only boast, we only brag, we only glory in Jesus Christ. That's a mark of knowing Christ. Now, here's what I'm not going to do in this message. I'm not going to give you the marks of people who don't know Christ. But I'll say this. Those who don't legitimately know Christ, you won't see this in their life. You won't see it. You'll see the opposite. You'll see something else, but you won't see worshiping or living a life devoted to God, led by the Spirit of God. You won't see somebody who glories in Christ Jesus alone, not in any of their own efforts, any of their own abilities. And here's the third thing. We put no confidence in the flesh. He said, we're the circumcision, the ones who worship by the Spirit of God, boast in Christ Jesus, and do not put confidence in the flesh. This is tied to the second one, that we only glory or we only brag in Jesus Christ, but he needs to say it by itself. It needs to be said on its own. We are not right with God because of anything that we bring to the table. Those who have been redeemed from their sin, it's not because there was something unique and special about them or they were a little bit better than all the other sinners. We don't bring anything to the table. We've got nothing to add. We don't put any confidence in the flesh. None of our efforts can add one iota to the work of Jesus Christ. We don't put confidence in the flesh. But he goes on, he, he, he drills down on this. He says, although I have reasons for confidence in the flesh... I do. And then he says this, if anyone else thinks he has grounds for confidence in the flesh, I have more. He's saying this, hey, line up. Line up. Tell me how good you are. Tell me all the good things you've done. Tell me all the reasons why you deserve Jesus Christ, why you deserve to be forgiven. Line up, because whatever you have confidence in, I have more. Little, he has a lot of confidence, almost cocky, right? But he said what? The people who know Christ, a mark of them, is that they don't put any confidence in anything of the flesh. So he puts himself up as an example, not because he's saying, look how awesome I am. This is why Jesus loved me. He's saying, even though I did all of this, I don't put any confidence in any of it. And then he tells us what it is. No confidence in ritual. He says this, I have more. Verse five, circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews. Circumcised the eighth day. He doesn't put any confidence in the ritual. He says, I followed all the rules. Literally from birth, everything was by the book. A young Jewish boy was to be circumcised on the eighth day. Not the seventh day, not the ninth day, the eighth day. You don't want to miss this, right? You don't want to sleep through this. Especially if you're going to be a Hebrew among Hebrews. Especially if you're going to have the status and the rank. Especially if you're going to stand before Paul and say, I've got confidence. He said, I've done everything right. You think you're you're good? I'm better. Circumcised on the eighth day, no confidence in ritual. I was of the nation of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, no confidence in his ethnicity, no confidence in his lineage. It doesn't matter if your daddy was a preacher or your granddaddy was a preacher. There's no confidence in that. I'll be honest with you. Everybody I meet, their granddaddy was a preacher. Apparently, that's all granddaddies used to do was be preachers, okay? Okay? There's no confidence in that, though. That's awesome. I'm glad he was. I hope he led lots of souls to Jesus Christ. That doesn't help you get any closer to Jesus. No confidence in the flesh. No confidence in his rank. Regarding the law, I was a Pharisee, teacher of the law. Regarding zeal, persecuting the church. No confidence in his passion, how passionate he was in what he believed. Regarding the righteousness that's in the law, blameless. No confidence in how good he could be or how well he could obey the rules. The marks of people who legitimately know Christ 
They live a life devoted to God, led by the Spirit of God. They only glory and they only boast and brag, not in anything that they do, but in Jesus and what he has done. And they put no confidence in anything that they can do to make them right with God. Anything. Like I was putting that point in, and I, I, you guys will notice. Could you go back to the slide that shows we put no confidence in the flesh? Could you, could you jump back to that? It'll only take a second. There we go. We put no confidence. And I underline confidence because i, I got to give you something to write. You know, it helps us remember. But really, you should circle the word no. Highlight it. No. This is where we get tripped up. Because some of us think, no, I don't put any confidence in the flesh. But then when we start talking about how we actually have come to know Christ, there's so much emphasis on something that we did and not on what he did. These are the marks of those who know Christ. And then he goes on to talk about how you can know Christ. That's the third part, verses 7 through 11. He says this, but everything that was a gain to me, all those things he just listed, I've considered to be a loss. If there was an accounting book and they said, okay, t- carry terrible, worthless sinner, uh, Jesus forgiven, account zeroed out, doesn't owe any debt for his sin anymore because of what Jesus did, yeah. Then, then we have a tendency to think that we can do something to add an additional positive to the ledger. Sold everything he owned, moved to a little village in Africa. That's got to be worth something, right? No confidence. No confidence in the flesh. Everything that I thought was a gain, a plus, I count as a loss compared to Jesus. Everything I thought would help me get closer to God didn't help me at all compared to knowing Jesus. I've considered to be a loss because of Christ. Verse 8, more than that, I also consider everything, not everything that I had, but everything to be a loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Because of him I have suffered the loss of all things and consider them as dung. It's the worst thing he could think of so that I may gain Christ. So that I may gain Christ. So how can you know Christ? Verse 9 says this, And be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own from the law, or in other words, not righteous because of what I have done or how good I have been, but one that's through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God Based on faith. How to know Christ? Trust Christ alone as your righteousness. Paul said he was blameless. Do you remember that? When it came to obeying the law, I was blameless. Kept all the commandments. All of them. All the rules, all the laws. Because we always, when we think of the law, most of us go straight to like the Ten Commandments. Those are the big ten. Do you not realize that there were hundreds of other laws and guidelines and restrictions? And he said this, when it came to obeying all of that, blameless. Seriously? You never broke any of them? Nope. But I, he said this, but I don't want a righteousness that's based on that. I want the righteousness that only comes through faith in Jesus Christ. And why is that? Because even though Paul was blameless, he could never live up to the standard of sinless perfection. You remember Jesus teaching, right? He came on the scene and he liked to take the laws that everybody knew and understood and thought they were doing really well at and he would take them to another level. So he'd say something like this. Uh, You've heard uh, thou shalt not kill. Everybody goes, yeah, that's amen, amen, preacher. That's right, I don't, I haven't ever killed anybody. Congratulations, you never murdered anybody. Most of us don't. And he said this, but have you ever, have you ever hated someone? You ever wish someone was dead? You ever wish they'd never been born? You ever wish that you never met them? You ever dishonored the image of God that is in that person because of something they did, the color of their skin, how much money they have or don't have, the education they have or don't have, what country of origin they're from? Have you ever done that? You ever hated them? It's as though you killed them. It's as though you murdered them. Only Jesus can take the standard of the law and then take it to another level. And you know what the other level is? It's actually not a higher level. It's a deeper level because it's not about surface level. Congratulations, you haven't murdered anybody. But have you ever hated? Guilty. Guilty. 
You've heard it said, thou shalt not commit adultery. That's right, amen, preacher. No adultery, not for me. I'm faithful. Have you ever looked at a woman with lust in your heart? Not just a higher standard, it's a deeper standard. Congratulations, you never committed adultery, but have you lusted in your heart? It's as though you committed adultery because God looks past our rule keeping and he looks at the heart and what the heart desires. And so for Paul, he said, I never broke any of the rules. I did everything perfectly by the book from birth on, but I wasn't sinless in my heart. I did things for the wrong reason. I pursued things for the wrong purposes. I did it so that I could boast in it. I did it so I could have confidence in it. I don't want a righteousness that comes from me keeping the rules. I want the one that comes from faith in Jesus Christ because that's the only one that can save me. If you were to die and you, if it worked this way, and I don't believe that it does, but if you found yourself at the gates of heaven, and of course, who's going to be there? St. Peter, because he's got nothing better to do. And he says, why should I let you in? You could be like Paul and start listing all the rules you've never broken, all the good things you ever did. And then you have the standard of Jesus, the standard that goes to the heart, the standard of love. He says, but did you violate him in your heart? Because that's hard. Without Jesus, it's impossible. The Bible says that when Adam sinned as our first father, that death came into the world, And sin came with it, or maybe it's the other way around. And because of that, it infected everybody who came after. All of us are born with a terminal disease, and it's called sin. And there's only one cure, and that is a righteousness that's not based on anything that I have done, but on Jesus Christ alone, faith in him alone. You want to know Christ? You see, only righteous people get to go to heaven. But I don't have any righteousness on my own, and as it turns out, I can't produce righteousness. But I need righteousness. The Bible says that there is no one good, no, not one. It says that all have sinned and fallen short. First John says that if you say you don't have sin, you're a liar. And lying's a sin. Only righteous people get to go to heaven, but I don't have any righteousness and I can't make any. I've got to find a source of righteousness. And there's only one, Jesus He came to this earth and he was perfectly sinless and righteous. And then he went to the cross and he died. Not just to be a display of love, it was that. He did it to do work. And the work was he was going to take on all of the sin that had ever been committed and ever would be committed. And he was going to die as the substitutionary sacrifice to take the penalty and the punishment for all of that sin. And because he did that, he now extends his righteousness to you. And through faith, You get Jesus' righteousness. Paul says, that's what I want. I want the righteousness that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that is based on faith. Jesus' righteousness will be given to us through faith. This is the opposite of works-based righteousness that says, I can be good enough. I can produce righteousness. You can't. There's a word for what we're talking about here, this trusting in Christ alone for your righteousness. The church word is justification. You may have heard that. This is what we're talking about. How are you justified or made right before God? Justification is a gift, and it is received by faith, not through anything you do. Is that the gospel you have believed? How to know Christ? You trust Christ as your righteousness. Here's the second thing. You know Christ more and become more like him. There's a church word for that. It's called sanctification. It's called sanctification. He says this, verse 10, my goal is to know him, that's Jesus, and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. Paul had a goal. This is the guy who just bragged about all the things that he was so good at, all the things he had done. He did not have an I've arrived attitude. He did not think he was, he didn't think he knew Jesus well enough. He's traveling, preaching, planting churches, writing so much of the New Testament. And he was like, I had, I don't know, I want to really know him. I'm thinking, you probably know him pretty good. He's, he's using you to write the Bible. No, I want to know him. So how do I know him? 
want to know the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings. I want to be conformed to his death. What does it mean to be conformed to his death? Does that mean I have to die on a cross like Jesus to get to know him? Being conformed to his death isn't about the way he died. It's about the attitude of laying his life down, of humbling himself for the good of others. I want to know him. I want to experience all that. I want to be conformed to his death. You want to know Jesus? You will know him, and then you will become more like him. So, man, i got to clean my life up. I gotta, I, there's better things I need to do. I need to think better. I need to act better. I need to do all these things better. How do I do that? Do I need a set of rules? Nope. You need to know Jesus better. You can't live like him if you don't know what he's like. And as you get to know him more, you will become more like him. Guys, we see this in our own earthly relationships, don't we? The the more time you spend with somebody and the more you get to know them, you will start acting like them. You'll start talking like them. You'll start using mannerisms and and cliches that they use. What is going on? You seem different. Oh, he's been hanging out with that guy. He sounds just like him. The more we get to know Christ, the more we become like him. He says, I want to know him. I want to know the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his suffering. And as that happens, I'm going to be conformed to his death. I'm going to be willing to die like Jesus. I'm going to be willing to lay my life down for others. Jesus came. He was sent. He was sent to reach the, the, the lost. He was sent to reach the, that, that lost sheep. I'm going to become like that. I want to know Christ and become more like him. This is sanctification. J.I. Packer said this. Once you become aware that the main business that you're here for is to know God, most of life's problems fall into place of their own accord. Does that mean that if I get to know Jesus better, everything is just awesome all the time? No. What happens is when you realize what your first priority is, why you're on this planet is to know God, your other things begin to rearrange themselves. God doesn't intend for you to spend the rest of your life trying to figure out the mess of your life. You can spend all your time trying to focus on the mess that your life is, and some of our lives are really messy. You can spend all your time focusing on that, and it will never get better. But if you try to get to know God, you'll become more like Jesus, and those things begin to take care of themselves. The problems are still there, but you, because you're living by the Spirit of God, you're led by the Spirit of God, you have wisdom in what decisions to make. You have wisdom in what things to just take your hands off of and go, that's way out of my control. You become more like God. The word says that the fullness of God dwelled in Jesus. Everything that you need to know about God was revealed in the life of Jesus. And everything you need to know about Jesus is revealed in his word. I want to know him. How do I get to know him? He told you everything you need to know about him right here. It's all there. I want to know him. I want to be more like him. I want to be conformed to him. I want to be like Jesus. So you trust Christ alone as your righteousness. You know Christ more, become more like him. And the third thing is that you anticipate the coming glory. There's a church word for this. It's called glorification. All believers experience justification and then sanctification, and then ultimately we will experience glorification. He says this, My goal is to know him and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death. And then he says this in verse 11, Assuming that I will somehow reach the resurrection from among the dead. Assuming. Somehow. This sounds like he doesn't really know what's going to happen. Does it seem like he's a little bit uncertain or a little bit unsure? Most scholars agree that Paul is not uncertain about his destiny or about going to heaven, about being reunited with Christ, but he is completely unsure of the timing and the circumstances. Me too. You too, right? You don't know when you're going to die, and you don't know how it's going to go down. You don't. You may think you do. Go visit a psychic. Have them flip over the cards. Guess what? They don't know. You don't know. You don't know how much time you have. Paul didn't know what was going to happen next. He didn't know how this imprisonment was going to work out. He didn't know if he was going to be martyred. He didn't know if he was going to die of old age. He didn't know. But he was just going to assume, he was going to go ahead and believe in advance that somehow, meaning however it is that God is going to do it, 
I'm going to experience the resurrection of the dead. And this isn't just about resurrection. Paul also was very well aware of the fact that Jesus could come back during his lifetime. It didn't happen. My whole life. I tell people all the time, every time my birthday comes, I always will say kind of half jokingly, I just never thought I'd live this long. And they'll go, really? You thought you would die young? And I said, honestly, I thought Jesus would be back by now. As a kid, that's what I was taught. So I just believed it. I just believed Jesus is going to come back in my lifetime. And I always just anticipated it. I remember as a child going to bed and laying my head down and thinking, Jesus is going to come back tonight while I'm asleep. I'm going to get woke up by the trumpet. I know I was a nerd. We've already established that with the dog thing earlier. I just believed it. I anticipated it. We should be anticipating it. Why? Because it's not about resurrection. It's not just about heaven and streets of gold. It's about being with Jesus. And that's what he wanted. Do you guys not remember a couple chapters ago? He said, I'm torn. If I stay, I get to keep serving, and that helps you. But if I leave, I get to go be with Jesus, and that's far better. And I want to be with Jesus. You just want to be with Jesus. The last song we sang, I want to be close. The more you get to know Jesus, the more you're going to want to be with him, with him. Not just experiencing the power of his resurrection, not just the fellowship of his suffering, but actually being with him. The ultimate prize that awaits us is not a mansion in glory. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. The ultimate goal and the guaranteed outcome for all those who know Jesus is that we will one day be with him. So why the warning? Why the worry? Why write this section? Many of us agree with what Paul's teaching here. We agree with all that about the marks of knowing Christ. We agree with that about how to know Christ. Well, I said it earlier, but the value of knowing Christ can't be overestimated and our tendency to embrace false gospels can't be underestimated. He wanted them to know. And this is the only way to know that you are right before God is to know Christ and receive his righteousness. So the glaring, obvious question is, do you know? 